Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's uh, 3.31, so we will jump in and get started uh, with our presentation today. So we're very, very happy to have you here uh, for our second session on our first uh, installment of the Empowering Teaching Excellence Seminar Series uh, for Spring 17. So um, we are happy to have here, and I'm going to actually read the names so I get them right because my brain doesn't always, I can't necessarily talk and think at the same time. So we have uh, Tanya Triplett, um, Christina Sharp, Fee Busby, Chad Simon, Corey Christensen, and Scott Allgood uh, here for our panel. And uh, for the moderator, we were going to have Heidi Kessler, but I think we have a pinch hitter today, right? So, because uh, Heidi's uh, lost her voice recently. So, but we will turn some time over to Heidi here shortly to give uh, some awards. I'll just give some. Um, some basic house cleaning items before we get started. So in this room, you'll notice up here at the top, there are microphones uh, pointing down towards you. Uh, we are recording this session. And so um, you'll notice also on your tables, there's little buttons. Don't push those buttons. Um, it'll actually be a lot easier. We'll manage this a lot better and be able to pick up your comments and send them out to the regional campuses if we just let Sean back here do the one that enables the, the room mics. So don't worry about the buttons, just start talking, and uh, Sean back here will take care of you and make sure that your audio gets picked up. Um, so uh, let's see, today's uh, topic is about student retention, and I'll just tell you from my own personal experience, when we had a pre-meeting before this, and we sat down with these panelists, and they just started talking about what they would share, I got really pumped. I felt very excited about the things that, that we were hearing. I came away feeling very inspired. So I know we're going to be in for some good stuff today, and I'm really excited about it. Um, and also, before we uh, turn things over, I'd like to remind you about um, some of our upcoming ETE events. We have our faculty seminar on March 1st, and we'll be featuring Barbie Honeycutt, and she is kind of becoming sort of the national, if any of you have looked at um, the Magna teaching publication, she's kind of a big name in there and does a lot of touring and a lot of publishing around um, flipping the classroom. So that will be the topic. She'll be coming in, it'll be a very workshop style event. Uh, so bring your devices, come ready to actually work on flipping a lesson. Um, and she'll be walking us through that. And then for those of you who are interested in the, content, the concept of competency-based education, we'll be looking at that on March 30th with a representative from the Educational Advisory Board named Matt Pellis here to come and, and uh, speak to us about that. Um, also, I will direct your attention to um, empowerteaching.usu.edu, our website, where you can find information about these. And... Um, one thing that we just added under our resources section is an ETE Canvas course. The benefit of going to this Canvas course is that you can register for seminars. In fact, I would encourage you to go and do that for this one that you're at right now if you haven't. Um, and uh, you can also go down, if you're participating in the ETE 10 badging program where you can get badges and, and things for attending events like these and for participating in some of these activities, you can actually view your badges there, um, apply for them, and, uh, and manage all of that within that Canvas course. When you go to that course, there will be an Enroll button up here at the top right. Um, if you're on a really small screen, that button's going to be probably way down here at the bottom. So, but either way, you can enroll yourself and have access to those resources. Um, so uh, we'll turn the time over to Heidi. All right. Um, so I was. So my name is Heidi Kessler, and I'm the director of student retention and completion um, for Utah State University. So I think about retention. I think about how we can help students want to stay and how to help them succeed and 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 complete here at Utah State. Um, and I was talking to Matt Sanders, Dr. Matt Sanders. Um, I don't know, a few months ago, and saying, you know, I know that there are some amazing faculty doing some great things related to retention. How can we highlight that for other faculty so that, that others know what's happening, but also so that they feel like they can be recognized? And, and he suggested an award. 
And I thought that was a great idea. And so we are instituting actually two awards um, that will become annual awards um, for faculty. And the first recipient, um, Tanya, would you come up here? And Richard, we can have also, I'm gonna make sure I get the right one. All right, so this is Tanya Triplett and she is receiving the Student Retention Faculty of the Year Award. She's out of the Department of Physics, um, College of Science. This is her associate dean. <clears throat> and Tanya teaches one of the most um, popular um, gen ed courses. And so it's huge, and it's mostly freshmen. And she has done some really great, innovative things that um, help those students know that they are not just a number um, in campus, that they are a person, and that they have somebody looking out for them and aware of, of them when they have an initial stumble. And so it's not just waiting until you know week, week 10 that she says, whoa, you're failing the class. She reaches out to them early and often and has some great ways, and as a true scientist, she also collects data on this and, um, and really tracks it. And she's gonna share some of that with us. Um, what I don't think you know, Tanya, she knew she was getting this award, but um, the vice, James Morales, the vice president of um, student affairs is making this a $500 award as well oh, as thanks. the plaque. And so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, do you want to say anything? No, just that we're very proud of our lecturers um, in the across the college in all of our departments. They, um, with some of the very best teachers that we have, they're very, very dedicated to our student success. So, thanks to Tonya for all you do. Thank you. All right, and we'll hear from her in a in a bit. Christina, you want to come up and that? <clears throat> so the second award goes to Christina Sharp. And, um, and this is for the Student Retention Researcher of the Year Award. Come over by. And this is her associate dean, Matt um, Sanders. And Christina came um, a year and a half ago to Utah State University and had barely made it onto campus before she was being introduced to um, people in student affairs, Lisa, myself, and others, because she has a great interest in researching um, the transition of students from their home life to their life here on campus. And taking that data, taking that information, and turning it into really good practices for how we can help make that transition smoother, um, how to help them navigate those difficulties. She comes to us, um, she teaches in communication studies in the College of um, Humanities and Social Sciences, and um, she teaches a quantitative community communication studies course, sorry. And, um, and so she is teaching these techniques to upperclassmen, but then is so engaged with our freshman population in, in helping us identify um, what their needs are. And so she is receiving the, the Researcher of the Year Award, also a $500 award for you um, from our um, Vice President, James Morales. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> Uh, Christina's a rock star. She's uh, just jumped in, and it's great to see faculty using their their expertise to help move this, the university's mission forward in great ways. And I couldn't be happier or proud of Christina. Um, and so I've I've asked both of these women um, to present some of some of what they're doing. And let's see. I think does it matter? I don't know if things are cued one way or another. I, I think so too. So, okay, so we'll start with Tanya and then we'll um, move on to Christina and they'll just briefly share what, what it is they're doing and feel free to ask them questions about, about what they do and the difference it's making for students. And then we'll go straight into the panel. Christina has agreed to, to moderate that panel because it's my voice. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. Okay, so in, in recognition of all numbers nerds out there, uh, I, I love my students and I'm also fascinated with numbers. And so 
I, I've been researching and asking the question, you know, what is it that makes a difference? And how can I identify students who are in trouble early on? So do I have control of that? Who's driving? Oh. Wow, OK. Hang on, I can drive like usual. OK, I got it. So I do have a big introductory class. And it's been called Intelligent Life in the Universe, which is sort of ironic in this story. Um, and it used to be USU 1360, and when we changed over to the new structure, now it's a physics number, which makes it even scarier, so that's always good. Um, and my students, I can classify them, you know, by their characteristics. They're almost all freshmen. This is taught fall semester. We don't teach it in spring because we have trouble using the observatory. Um, it's a little snowy or foggy, and so those are our trade-offs. But we teach it in the fall. And these students get steered there by central advising because their most common major is undeclared. Um, there are many names for that. You know, some of them are exploratory and other names for that, but they don't know what it is that they're here to learn. And so the course doesn't have any prerequisites, and so they can just jump right in and take a physics course because some advisor told them that was a great idea. Thank you, central advising. You know, thanks for sending them to me because, to be honest, I know who they are. And um, as ugly ducklings that they might be, I want them. They're, they are the ones I want to have sitting in my classroom because I hope to make the biggest difference. The problem, though, is that because of who they are, they are historically underprepared to attend college. And I can predict about a 29 to 30% failure rate on the first exam. It comes early. I, I offer it just at the beginning of week four. So it's too late to drop, um, which works for me. I don't want them to leave. But something needs to be done because now 30% of my class is failing, and I know this. And so I started a program of remediation, um, which in physics, uh, weirdly, I named it that before I knew how offensive that was. So anyway, moving on. Um, but how to clean up a mess. And to be honest, they're in one by the time they get to this point. And so I have three things that go on if you fail my test. And I should tell you what I think of as failing. 72%. I don't know that every student wants to get a C minus, and 72 is. But I figure if you get 72 or below, you're in trouble. It's an introductory course. You know, there isn't a prerequisite, that, and you can't get a C. And I think they're in trouble at 72%. And so everybody under 73 gets a loving email from me. And I have worked on it over time. They don't know that they're getting a form letter. Um, <laughs> but it just says, in really, I'll, I'd read it to you if you want later. But I'm concerned. I know you can do better. I know you're disappointed. I don't think this is your best work. I know that this is not where you want to be. And I offer an extra assignment in the email. And the assignment is a study skills assignment. Has very little to do with what we've learned in these first four weeks, in fact, zero. It's forward looking, not backward looking. And they complete a study skills assignment over the next section of the course. And my class is very structured with learning objectives. They predict what that learning objective will be like on the next test. They write it for me. I ask for handwritten. Um, weirdly, it turns out better for them. Lots of studies on that. Anyway, I ask for handwritten work. And they write for me a number of multiple choice questions about learning objectives in the next section of the course. The exchange is a grade of 73% on the first test, which for everybody is at least a one point bump. But it's scaled so that somebody who did very poorly writes many more questions than somebody who did better. And so this scaled assignment brings their first test up and teaches them how to study. That's the goal of the assignment and prepares them to take the second test. Um, I also offer additional outside help. You know, these are my office hours. Come visit. I have snacks, which weirdly, you feed them, they will come. Um, and usually offer a menu. and then invite them to office hours, which they don't come to because they think they're in trouble. And I struggle with presenting this, you know, that this isn't punitive and please come get help. I'd love to be the one who talks to you. 
Um, but that is a challenge to get students to attend office hours. But still, a large fraction of them take advantage of that portion too. So what I asked myself was, what would be the outcome of this? And since I've taught this class a lot of years and the class is pretty big, I have good stats. So I looked for compliance rates. And in 2011, I started sending this as an email, where before I did it as a classroom announcement. Here's your assignment if you want to do it. And sending the email really improved compliance rates. So more people did the assignment. And so I went from 38%, and now we have a right around 50%. But still, that means 50% of all the students who failed the test still don't seek additional help. And that's a problem to me. And so I send them out another reminder email later that says, you know, remember, this is the assignment, and you're going to do this for points. And I know that it's a problem, and so they get a reminder later on as well. But the effect is interesting. I wondered what the effect of the email itself was, not whether or not they completed the assignment. But since I didn't send the email before and then I started, I can see the difference. And so I looked at just pulled 2009, 2011, so across the boundary. And their score on completion of the test for everybody I sent it to, so the 30%, they get almost a 6% increase on the next test from their previous score because I sent an email. Because I said, I care about you. I know you can do better. You need to study more. These are the things you need to be working on. Come see me. And almost a 6% increase because I sent an email. That's separate from what, it, what they get if they complete the assignment. This is just the email effect. And I can tease it out. And my comment as a, to other instructors is, if you knew that your students would get 6% better on their next test because you told them, you looked at their grade and believed more of them, wouldn't you send the email? And you know, it's just it's a simple step. You can do it in Canvas. And just that single contact has such a big effect. Um, the next part, though, is what if they do the assignment? And it's really interesting to watch test scores. And so, data hounds, here you go. Um, test scores from the two two years, 11 and 12 up. And so you can watch the passing students. Those are people who didn't get an email from me. I figure they are untreated. And um, then the students who completed, they're in red. And those remediated students, and look at the big jump in their test score for completing this study assignment. It's guided towards the course. They study for me, for our class. But it's between 12 and 15%. And so it depends on the year and uh, some other factors that I'm at a loss to tease out. I really need a better stats friend. Anyway, um, but a huge jump in their score for completion of the assignment. And they retain some of it as well. It does drop off. Um, weirdly, study skills go to wherever they go in December, because I cannot find a, an excuse for what happens to the final, even for good students. But I think that's just a finals effect. But overall, they get that big jump on the second test and remain higher than their original test scores throughout the rest of the class. And because of the correction to their first test score, they remain, well, completers of the course. And so I asked, what was the effect if I don't include somebody? You know, what's the real effect? And I compared them to people who didn't fall into my group. They passed 74%. 75%, 76%. So I pulled them from 74 to 78 to make a comparison to see what happened to them. And they're the purple ones shown here. And they track class averages, but not the remediated group. Doing the assignment, getting the email really matters. Which brings me to a scary question, do I love them less? You know, I don't send them an email. And so their scores don't change. And so is there something else we can do in this gap that would make a difference for that group of students? Because clearly, they're not benefiting from that teacher contact. Um, office visits, I wish, I wish, I wish. Another story. So um, if our goal is really that goal that we talk about, to have as many students successfully complete the course as possible, then not taking these actions in my class constitutes educational malpractice for me. You know, the day after that first test is given, if I'm not sending out that email, I know how much it costs them to not hear that I looked at your score. I don't think you're happy.
happy either. Stop suffering, I'm going to give you an assignment. You know, to give that feedback that I know where you are. And ultimately, as an instructor at Utah State, I know that we have so many things that students have to do to pass. To complete school, there are so many different pieces that have to come together for them. But I also know that I can be the one thing that can get them to leave. And we each stand in that place where we could be the one and only reason that they drop out. And it's, it's a different way to see ourselves in the classroom to acknowledge that we have that much horrible power. Anyway, that's where I am. So Christina, <laughs> thanks. The great part of me is that I don't have statistics to show you. And I'll be presenting on my research. <laughs> Mike. Um, so, like Heidi said, I came to the university about a year and a half ago, and primarily, um, I'm the director of the Family Communication and Relationships Lab, and primarily I study that families who are in some sort of transition. Um, my research in the past has been on family estrangement, adoption, postpartum depression, unintended pregnancy, but um, we were really lucky, my colleague Elizabeth Dorrance Hall and I, when we got here, that Matt Sanders took us over to meet Heidi and Lisa about the big transition in the lives of students um, and the transitions that their parents are also facing. And so um, we started down a road of research since we've been here that address um, a variety of issues that our students at USU might particularly face. Um, I brought in some homesickness research for me from my past institution, but since we've been here, we've collected both qualitative and quantitative data on undergraduate student parents, which um, the prevalence at, in Utah is much higher than you might find in other places, and how our undergraduate student parents are managing being students, being first-time parents, trying to hold down a job to support their schooling and their parenting. Um, we've also been able to collect some dyadic longitudinal data um, from parents and their children um, in the beginning as they transitioned to Utah State at SOAR. So we asked parents a bunch of questions about how they raised their kids and what type of environment that was. We also asked their students how they perceive how they were raised. And we've found a lot that the communication environment that um, parents have in their household before students has a lot, brings a lot to bear on whether their students are resilient or able to um, ask for support when they're here. So one of the big findings we found um, is that families who promote communication um, in, in an open environment, not just that they talk a lot, but the topics that they talk about are very broad, like nothing's off the table. Those students are much more likely to ask for support. They're more able, they're more motivated to do so, um, and they perceive a lot of support when they get here. Um, consequently, children who grow up in environments where there's a lot of very strict rules, um, where children are told that you have to believe what the parents believe, they end up becoming um, less resilient when they get to college. So they have a much harder time bouncing back from the problems they experience when they're here. So a lot of our research has to do with the things that parents might be able to do, the environments they're able to create before their children get here that set them on good patterns for later. Um, we have also looked at student concerns. So a lot of times what happens is that universities ask students when students are leaving, why did you leave? And they check a box, right? Is it financial reasons? But we said, maybe we're missing something. So we started asking students about the concerns they have while they're at college and turns out they're um, fairly different than the reasons why universities ask students why they left. So we're um, redesigning some questions that might be able to capture more of people's experiences. So it's not just like, I didn't like my teacher. Something super personal happened to them at home where they had to go home. Um, another thing that we're doing is we're evaluating the connections 
um, conflict workshop. So we just added a workshop about the way students handle conflict and we're seeing how that's working out. And then Matt Sanders and I are working on a project about ask, interviewing students about why they leave USU, especially when they're in good standing. So why are you transferring? Um, what's going on? So that is hopefully a brief explanation of the <laughs> research that's coming out of our lab. But we're really so appreciative um, of Lisa and Heidi for all the support they've given us and the access to the students. And we really hope that we can make a difference for the students at Utah State. I'm going to be moderating this for Heidi's voice, um, and we're going to be taking some questions either from you or from the other campuses about um, how these amazing folks have been able to care for and mentor and help retain their students. Sure. You have your class of 500 students. 30% is 150. Yes, that is. You send two emails, that is 300. How could you do this? You send email individually or the same email, just change the name? Okay, so 11 teacher would have changed everything about it, but no, I have developed a beautiful form system. Um, <laughs> and so they get pretty much the same email as their friends. They don't know who else got them. You know, they're, it's not a group email with all the other failures on the recipient's list, um, but that would be a, a problem. So I think your question, though, was, is this hard to do? And the truth is, within Canvas, is very simple. You can go into the score of the test, select, see, email everybody who got less than blah, 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 and send them off an email that says, no, I've looked at your score. And I suggest you actually change the title of that, because not loving but <laughs> anyway but you can select it within canvas and send it really fast if you want to just catch them and then people who have not submitted this assignment send that you know and I use that canvas feature oh and by the way in education I would like a canvas feature that would let me choose a range so right now I can be above or below but I don't get like 72 to 76 percent or things like that and so you'd have to tease that out and then put it back into canvas to choose but you know, it's okay, clearly okay. possible. Other questions? I wonder if perhaps we could have just uh, some of the other the panelists share a little bit of what they learned in their classes with regard to this. Yes. <laughs> I happen to teach in the College of Natural Resources, which is a professional school. And so about, except for two majors, and I'll talk to those specifically in just a moment, except for two majors, a student walks in to the College of Natural Resources and they say, I want to be a <coughs> forester, a wildlife biologist, a fisheries manager, something. I teach the Natural Resources 2000 class, which is the orientation class that's required of every student in the college at the entry level. And I get most of them at the entry level, I get some of them at graduating seniors. That's an advising problem that is an issue. First lecture, I put a slide on the board that says, where are you going? Question. And on the, spot, on the, the slide is a group of students holding a Utah State University diploma. And I tell them, graduation is just step one. So why you're here is to prepare to make a difference in how the natural resources of the world are managed. And then for the rest of the semester, I drive that home. And so the answer to my question, what I do, <clears throat> in that class to try to retain students is give them a lifetime purpose for being in college today. It's the benefit of being a professional student. Here they're not, one of them is environmental studies, which is a general education approach where students can choose, choose different approaches. And the other one is conservation restoration ecology, where once again they can choose a variety of electives. 
<clears throat> in each of those, as I do the interview with each student at the beginning of the semester, I drill in and try to find out what they're interested in. And when I get it, I send them to that professor. I know there's a professor in the college that has the same interest that they do. I say, go talk to him or her. And I pass the baton to the next person to make the first move. Great. Um, so I'm Chad Simon. I, I'm from. I teach accounting in the in the business school. I specifically teach audit, so you can tell how exciting my life is. Um, and I, so one thing that I had a colleague. At, I came from UNLV most recently. I was there for four years before coming to Utah State. It's my fifth year here now. And one thing that he did uh, it was he would meet with every student at the beginning of the semester. And that uh, you. And so what I do is I I offer five points to come and meet with me in my office. And I have a large section of one of what we call the business acumen courses right now. So that, that is a, a number of students, and it does take time to meet with all of them. But what, what I'm able to tell them is, look, there's no excuses now. You know where my office is. Uh, you, you know, hopefully, now that I'm approachable. And that if you have questions, uh, you know, we, we do have a tutor lab for, for this specific course. Uh, this is the introductory financial accounting course. Um, but I want them to just feel comfortable that they can come to me with their questions. I did have a student, I can't remember the situation, um, other than basically what was communicated was, it almost sounded like you don't go to the professor until there's a real problem. And I wanted them to know that if you have a problem at all during the course <laughs> with understanding a concept, I'm paid to be here and teach you that, that concept. Um, and so I think for me, one of the biggest things is just to be, pro be approachable. Um, I think uh, we, just had a, we just had a session that some of you were here for, for on, on teaching connections. I've had the opportunity to do that. That's a great way to get to know students. and, and on a, on a very very personal level, when you're with them for, for multiple hours across three days, you get to know them uh, to a degree. Um, I've done, uh, we, we started doing recently, and I think these used to be done a while ago, but in, in the accounting department, uh, I, I helped get going again, these career exploration trips just down to Salt Lake, and I'll have a van full of students, and then we just go down, and, and it's a great opportunity to talk to these students. Some of them I may have had before in class, others not. Um, but they're going to be in my major, and it's good to get to know them that way as well. Um, so I think just one-on-one -on -one interactions, and not just uh, you know just just being in the classroom, but seeing them outside of classroom. Um, and I think the real key, at least keeping them in the major, and and I would say I guess more broadly at Utah State is getting them involved in the campus community. I, when you talk to people, I'm not from Utah. Um, I, I grew up in Washington State. And I have a lot of state pride for Washington, but I've come to love Logan so much. Um, if you talk to people who aren't from or who have gone to school here, they absolutely love Cache Valley. They absolutely love Utah State. And I think one of the things we have to do is just not mess that up, if that makes any sense. <laughs> just keep, keep that level of, of being an Aggie alive. And I think that that's going to be one of the main things that where we, we are able to retain students, things like connections, but also just that, that general community feel here where it's not a cold place to come onto campus, even though it's been freezing outside. It's a, it's a very <laughs> friendly and, and just a welcoming place. And while we want to be rigorous and challenge them and prepare them for, the, for, for their careers and for life, um, if we can just keep it a, a welcoming place um, you know, in, our, in our classes and, and be approachable, I think that can go a long way as well. So, so I'm Corey Christianson. I'm in the music department. <clears throat> I'm not sure why I'm here, actually. <laughs> um, Heidi you know, called and or sent the email, and, and I, I, I was pretty upfront. Like, I don't really have any stats um <laughs> i notice my students when they're gone i guess but um but but we have pretty high retention and i think a lot of that is, is and i'm very fortunate uh all of my majors get specific one-on-one -on -one time with me uh, you know in, in music we we might be one of the last you know the last stands for real one-on-one -on -one, um, mentorship and uh there are a lot of times when I'm when I'm teaching in a, a studio lesson that I, to be honest, I feel like I'm kind of half guitar teacher and half therapist. <laughs> um, and I, luckily, I kind of know when to say, "Hey, this is about my pay grade." Uh, you know, we have uh, people that are much better than me at this. Uh, but it's it, it's a it's amazing the relationship that forms when you spend a lot of time with with the students, um, and so. Uh, so I get that luxury in the private lessons. I, I try and have my students at least three or four times over to my house um, just to share a meal. 
There's a lot of research uh, that's been done that just like eating with people uh, breaks down, um, you know, differences in in, uh, in everything, in race, culture, religion, everything. Uh, and not that I want my students to be too, you know, friendly with me. I mean, I have to, you know, there's kind of that balance of, you know, okay, I'm, I'm kind of your friend, but not, I'm, my first priority is to be your, you know, your educator. Um, but, uh, you know, we have such a, a strong community in, in the music department, to be honest. These, these students spend a lot of time performing together. We do trips together. Um, but I think the eating thing is, it's like actually kind of, a, it's really a, a, a big deal. Um, the other thing that, that I've tried to do, my students get really excited when we bring uh, guests to campus that are the best in the world at what they want to do. And I've made that a real priority, um, you know, if, as, as part of what I do here is to, you know, through some of my connections in the, in the real world of, of, of music to bring in, you know, top, top names of people that will work with these students and give them, you know, two or three days of like a lifetime experience, you know, somebody that they've looked up to for years and years and years. And now they get to be, you know, in a, 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 a classroom with this person or they might be down at the factory eating pizza and playing pool with this this person. Also, I try and make sure that they that they really feel that um, I don't know. I guess they're kind of getting to live their dream a little bit while they're in in school, and it seems to make a, a big difference. Well, I have a very different take. I am a therapist, and we appreciate the business. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we got plenty of money over. <laughs> so just as a, an aside. Uh, we have a family therapy clinic here on campus. In the last six years, we've gone from about 150 clients a year to 400, and four, in the ballpark of 450. Uh, the, the majority of them, 50, 55, 60 percent of them, are students. The <coughs> counseling center is overloaded. And one of the things you keep hearing from these kids over and over is, I don't have a connection. Nobody cares. But what, the reason I'm here is we have a very different take uh, for retention. I'm a first generation college student, and I realized I didn't know the questions to ask to be successful. Unfortunately, I had a very good mentor. And so I have an agreement with the faculty, if they can identify a good student, uh, and by good student, that means they're in, in our major or they're in our pre-major and they have a demonstrated history of being successful, uh, I will call them into my office and ask them, what they're doing. A common experience, we, and I do this four to five times a year, had a young woman in my office a week and a half ago, a, a, a young uh, Latino student, she's working four jobs, working almost 55 hours a week, carrying 15, uh, 15 credit hours. But what are the chances she's going to be successful? I, she's, she's behind to start with. So I cut them a deal. Talked about their career goals, they can articulate a career goal that's related to our major, what kind of a deal? So I will, I'll, I'll pay for a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars of your tuition if you'll quit two jobs. And if you maintain, if your grades are good at the end of this semester, then we'll do it again next year, and we will do this till you graduate. Now I, I recognize that not everybody has the flexibility of doing that, but I do, and so I do it. And if you have the flexibility to do so, it makes a difference. Uh, we have not lost a single one of our first-generation college students that we've worked with. They stay and they succeed. They not only succeed, but out of the 13 that we've helped so far, 12 of them have gone on to graduate school and done very well, which is amazing for a first-generation college student to be able to send that, those kind of folks on to grad, to grad school. The other thing that I do at department-wise is I go out in the halls three or four times a week during class change time just to shoot the breeze with the students. I want to know who they are. Why are, they, why are they in our major? And it gives me a wealth of information about our faculty, but it also gives me an insight as to who's taking our classes that I then pass along to the faculty. You ought to really be talking about this. Did you know you've got uh, a dozen kids in your class that are in a group therapy project together at the counseling center? Uh, did you know you've got this going on, this group of kids in your class? And, you, and you, when you can pass that information back along, to your instructors, the faculty have been very receptive of taking that information and then being able to incorporate some information in the class. The kids think they, they're miracle workers, 
And in actuality, it, it cost me about 40 minutes a week. It's a great investment in our young folks. So. I just want to say, answer Corey's question about YPAM. And I think that um, this is an awesome panel because we've got a former dean, we've got a department head, we have someone who teaches huge classes, we have someone who gets to teach one on one, um, we have someone who's been here several years and someone who's been here a year and a half. Um, and they're all doing things differently. Um, and yet they're all making an impact in schools. And so I think. That's why this this panel, I think, is, is kind of a dream panel because one of these people should be able to speak to your situation. They should be able to, to pull out um, some of the things that they're doing or just even some of the thoughts that come to your mind as you hear them speak that you can apply in your own um, classroom, outside the classroom, and in your own experience. And so there's not one right way to do these young things. There's not one right way to connect with students. And I think that's really well represented by this panel. And so I, I thank all of you for being on this panel and um, whether you're doing it in really intentionally <coughs> with, with, with stats or whether you're just doing it very um, organically, we all can make students really make a work. And that's why you're on this panel. So thank you. That was Heidi's political way of telling me I'm old. Because <laughs> obviously Fee's a lot younger. <laughs> I mention one more thing too that, that um, I, I just I need to do more of this, but I, I think we all so I, I try to have my students, not all of them come by the five points to meet with me, but I try I've noticed that I think we're all bothered when a student's unprofessional um, and, and doesn't have the tact and, and doesn't get it if, if you will. Um, but I last semester and I only did this in very limited cases, but I started pulling aside students who do get it and just telling them, you know, good job, keep it up, keep being professional, this is gonna carry you through life and Help you be successful. So just if we can highlight to them and encourage them, they may not actually be the at risk at risk students so much, but the ones I think it, it would be important to one on one kind of highlight it. And even in a large class, I think we're able to do that is to recognize that and acknowledge mm -hmm. it in a more you know, one on one setting. So. Two things then for me. I've done the recognizing the good students. If you ever want to know that you're doing the right thing, please send out congratulations, you got an A emails. Holy cow, every one of those will respond back, thank you, I love being in this class. <laughs> you know, if you're feeling down, send an email out, you know, way to go to your students, because that will come back. Um, the other thing is a gross misunderstanding among freshmen about um, office hours. They Office hours to them are a trip to the principal's office. My world is so bad that I have to go see my instructor. And so I talked to my students about, um, and Christina too, about coming to my office because sometimes your biggest problem today is that you have not had a snack. And I have a shelf of snacks. And you know, you can come choose because sometimes that is today's problem. And you can come into my office and have a few calories and say Which bye. Which office are you in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I was laughing. That's 500. <laughs> Way to go. Um, but, you know, it, um, maybe my TAs use that more than my other students, but, but they're happy to stop by every day. But the students come in and that first thing, hey, we're going to need a snack. And I think very much this eating with your group, you know, is so important. There's so many things that you could choose from. String cheese, way to go. Um, you know, and sit down and we can talk about anything you choose, not, wow, I don't know how to do physics. Because really, I would have noticed that. But is there other things that we should talk about? And I talk about this, and I think it's really important to do it right after that first test. Because they don't care before then. Um, they don't know that they should. But rather than the first day of the semester, when you say when your office hours are, say it again later and tell them what they're so that they'll come. I do, yeah, I do something similar. I have the office hours and I said, oh, I also have an hour a week. I call it Coco with Christina, where I tell them to come bring a bug and I have little treats in my office and they throw peeps and some hot chocolate. And they think it's not my office hours, right? Even though it is. And they're like, oh, and they come with their mugs and they come and sit down and tell me how they're doing. I think they feel 
like I'm a person. Like, oh, she cares about me as a person. And I'll just say, it's like, I'm like Matt's best cheerleader, but I have them all read Becoming a Learner, and they all read it in Connections, and I have them read it in my class again, and I ask them three times a semester to reflect on why they're here, just like Dee was talking about. And I think that, um, like, sometimes I even forget why I'm here, right? Like, oh, grading, right? But, like, the excitement you have around learning <laughs> and the excitement that they have around coming to college, I think it's lost in the day-to-day -day of, like, oh, I have a thousand pages to read. So I feel like that book is a great reminder of, like, the excitement and the opportunity you have to learn. So I'd like to assign that reading again, and they all love it. And they feel really satisfied, I think, that they know why they're here. I think one thing my students have appreciated um, also is, is, you know, when you, in a private lesson when a student does poorly, it's just a horrible hour. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not even like a job, it's torture um, for, both, for both of us. And um, so I've started doing this thing where if they come in and they're under, you know, they're underprepared or, you know, which is the equivalent of failing a, a, a test, really, that instead of just sending them away, um, a lot of times we'll just take a walk. And uh, that hour gets us out of the classroom and, you know, we're just going to talk, you know, you can, what's going on? Why didn't you practice? Why, you know, is this not happening today? Um, take only once, usually in a student's career, you know, do I do, I do the walk um, with them? And uh, before I came to Utah, I was teaching at Indiana University Music Building as a big circle. You know, we would just do the outside right. circle. <laughs> and it, and it also kind of helped that other students would be in kind of the lobbies on each end and they'd see me walking, they're like, oh, I get what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and the students I was walking. But it but it wasn't it wasn't a harsh thing. It was more like, okay, look, this wasn't happening this week. Everybody gets a mulligan. This is yours. Let's talk about what what went wrong. And there's something, you know, this communication thing kind of worked. I mean you could speak to it more than me, but it seems like you know, that, that has an impact on them. Like, okay, I failed, but I can do better. The teacher knows that, you know, that, uh, that I'm capable of more. Um, luckily, I don't have to do it 500 or, you know, 100, yeah, 300 I'd be times. A such good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. In my class in fall semester, I have 60 to 100 students. And the, the students who fail the first test also get an invitation to come and see me. It's a personal invitation. I tell them when I hand them back the test, you need to come and see me. For many of them, it's the first time they've had an essay test in their entire college career. And some of them have a, literally have a hard time stringing two coherent thoughts together in a way that makes sense. And so I have them come in, we look at their test, I, I look at their notes, how they're taking notes in class, and I tell them, fix this, and your grade will improve by at least 15%. And they, they're skeptical. I said, trust me, it works every time. And, and it does. And, and the feedback that you get consistently, like we've already heard, is the students, many of the students, have never had a personal connection with a faculty mm -hmm. member. And to, to sit down with them, even though they feel like they've been drugged to the principal's office, which in reality, in this case, it is, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you're a senior. You, this is a required class. You have to pass it. And I'm not letting you... You can't slide. And they come in and they <laughs> tend to do better. But you hear this, the same comment over and over. I've never been in my pro a professor's office before. Um, um, what do you think, I mean, it would be great if we could clone all of you and then we could solve all the problems, right? Like, or, yeah, or create new ones. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So what do, you, what do you think to faculty members who are like, that's not like, I don't, you know, like, Chad, like, we'll come by and visit you, like, if they want to come, they want to come, and if they don't, they don't, it's not my job, like, I don't need to do, I got to do my research and my creative work or whatever, and I said, we're all, we've all got a lot to do, but if this is what we want faculty to do, how do we help the faculty understand that this actually makes their lives a little bit easier? I mean, if the students split, kind of, you don't have a job. Yeah. 
I mean, that's the doomsday scenario, right? And that would never, that would never happen. But I don't know. I maybe those people exist. I, I, I don't work with them. You know, in, in my department, I mean, everybody seems to be like just so into teaching, and you know, so I'm, I'm probably not the best. Person. Well, no, I, I think to that point, one, one thought I had before this panel was we. We need to be careful when we're hiring here. I mean, we at least in, in my department, we don't we're not as big as a lot of programs, so we do have to attract people who are going to do good research and also um, care about teaching. Because this place, I, I feel very comfortable telling my students that this place, Utah State, my department, my school, really cares about and values teaching. I feel very comfortable here saying that. Um, and so I think when we're making hiring decisions, that 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 helps. Um, but I agree. I, I I think modeling it. I think. I think everyone who's here probably cares about this topic. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be here, I would assume. And so um, just modeling it, caring about it yourself, and, and when you're having those discussions, um, kind of conveying that, that, that this is exciting and, and enjoyable. Uh, because, I don't know, the, the research in, in all departments is, is important, I guess, in, in accounting. Um, we're, we're more like was brought up before, a professional, professional focus um, discipline. And so the teaching really, I think, has speaks a lot more than maybe the research in our department. But, yeah, I cut you off on that. No, so. no I, I think that it's important to speak it in our language. You know, we, we're we from a wide group of different people, and my experience, well, I mean, physicists are famous for being social misfits, and, you know, if that's true, then maybe we should speak the language of physicists, and so I back <clears throat> you with my numbers because uh, I speak that language, and so do my colleagues. And so I think saying it in our own language within our departments is so valuable. I, no, you go. The audience, absolutely. You go first. No, you first. No, you first. <laughs> first. <laughs> Can I ask kind of a personal question of each of you? Yeah. Sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> when you look at your faculty role statement, what's what's your breakdown, your percentage of teaching versus research versus, versus service? I'm just curious. Mine's 50 teaching, 40 research, 5. We, we have a little bit different in the business school, so 5 service and 5, something along the lines of professional interaction or engagement. So I'm a lecturer, mine's 90 teaching, 10 um, service, and zero research, which is why I don't care about any numbers. <laughs> <laughs> we have more than the rest of us. <laughs> 50, 40, you said? Uh, you don't have to do that. That's a full professor. <laughs> 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 Whatever you want it to be, right? So I'm I'm fifty research, forty teaching, and service. Mine's twenty percent teaching, eighty percent administration. Uh, so I teach two classes a year. Our, with two exceptions in our department, it's all fifty research, forty five teaching, and five research. I mean five service. service, right? But in terms of the question that came up earlier, what do you do with a faculty member? It says it's not my job. Well, <clears throat> I make it their job because I can. And so I tell them, if part of your job is to demonstrate excellence or effectiveness in, old, in, the, in your role of teaching, and you have to do that to have support from your committee, and I have the support of the, the department, you've got to have it from your committee, and you've got to have it from me that you're an effective teacher. And if I see, keep seeing the same comments, and your committee keeps seeing the same comments, there's no support. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your research looks like, uh, because that's, I think, almost an equal part of your job. And, and but, but it's a non-issue. We we never hear that because with the, the that's the expectation coming in. Mm -hmm. we we expect not only effectiveness, we expect excellence in teaching and research. I I think that's the case. Uh, I've been here since my first tenure at Utah State was in 1970. I've, I've seen this process a long time, and this, this attitude towards great teaching has always been part of it. You could be the greatest research in the world, and say about teachers teaching, you probably won't get any further. You're going to be invited to leave at the third, third year. Uh, so the issue is that not all of us are going to be, not all of us are going to wake up every morning, and our primary purpose is going to be to interact with students. There's faculty members out there that do, in fact, have other jobs. And other responsibilities like being, being an SF grant or other grants. 
They have all that work to do. So the issue is, whoever said it, that said each of us can be the one that causes a student to drop out. So the issue is, your Kansas State University as a whole needs to not have those faculty that cause a student to drop out. And those, like most of you here, I have no doubt, that have a desire to work with students, that's why you can't. You're already good. You could have been a Very good. Those of you that have that will be the ones that students go to, and the ones that they don't go to for the things that we talked about here, they will be in the lecture class with the teacher that will be getting a great education. And when they graduate, they'll be able to go out and make a great difference in the world, and we will have all succeeded. And we've been able, in my department, there's been more of a shift to research to, to build the reputation. I, I, cause, because that does help uh, with the national reputation, but the university, the department, and so on. Um, but again, if we're careful in who we select and, and find people who want to do good research and yet still care about teaching, I think we, we can continue to be successful. And, and I don't think that, and the nice thing is, too, you can talk about your research in your class. And that, and that maybe yeah. for to Matt's point er, earlier, Maybe that's where you get people excited more about teaching is if you can get them to talk about themselves and about their research, right? And maybe that gets them more engaged in, in the teaching process as well. So. so you can help faculty succeed by having them teach to their students rather than just covering a class. Yeah. Now, just to point out, what would possibly spot most? If you have students that are, I guess, a bit unfocused in terms of an ultimate career goal, are there services here on campus to help them clear up their thinking on what their their objective is? Because that would probably help them to get all the way through. So basis. this is not the most politically correct answer, and I will tell you that right up front. I believe that there are kids on this campus who should not be here that would be far better off going to Bridgerland because I, I have auto mechanic friends who cannot hire a good auto mechanic. But I, I kids on campus who would be great auto mechanics but think they have to be here to be successful in life. So depending on the level of the kid, I will send them either to career services or I will send them to Bridgerland for a comprehensive overview of their career options so that they have every, all options available to them. I think that's just the most ethical thing to do. So we're potentially sending them to counseling to actually talk about this might be... Well, the career counseling said that has all the options. It helps them get jobs afterwards. Uh, it's the Career Development Center, I think, is the correct title. Okay. It's in the basement of the University Inn. But they have some aptitude tests. But again, they're, they're geared more toward a college person. And if it's somebody that's really, really pretty vague, um, my option is to send them to Bridgerland so they have the whole array. array because I, I think we've, we've oversold college education for some of these kids that will be much happier in life and make a much bigger contribution in other places. I, I recognize this might not be the best place to say that. But. So that's so within within the major. I think we even get that same type of question, like wh where am I going to go with this major? And I think, well, I think that the advisors help a lot in a lot of areas. I think that's one area where, as a faculty member, we can really connect with them and, and say, look, I've seen these people do these things with with this degree, and maybe give them open their eyes to some of the options that are out there. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, just that one on one time again in the office. It's very informal. It's very. Uh, certainly not a scheduled thing and not a planned thing necessarily, but that, that can be a big, I think that can make a difference. Just a quick question. I don't know how familiar or how comfortable you are referring people to places like your services or if you even know about those services. But I know years ago we used to, once a year, do a workshop for all the advisors and we would have 10 minutes and your services would come in, 10 minutes academic resources would come in. And, and just let everybody know this is what we do and it helped everybody if a student came into them to say oh well we have an office that does this this we have this. that may be a future workshop that you just to do something like that with some of these key services that maybe a lot of faculty don't know or have ever heard of I, I learned that through teaching connections i was yeah. on campus for a lot of years working with students and until i taught connections i didn't realize you know how many services were out there for students so i mean that's it's very helpful i think get information well that's good thank you for that input that was really great so uh I, I think we could keep sitting here and, and listening to all the insights that everybody here has and keep asking questions we've run up against our hours so we'll have to call it good here if you have um, additional questions 
uh, feel free to come down if you want to talk to our panelists here afterward. Uh, um, or uh, we showed you that Canvas course. You can even like, post a question. <coughs> or, or, that would be fun. Um, we'd really, I'd really like to thank all of you for being here and also thank our panelists for their time and their attention. Let's give them a big round of applause. And also thanks to, uh, to Heidi for uh, proposing this, uh, this panel uh, and organizing it. This has really been beneficial. I've learned a lot. I've really enjoyed this a lot. So um, thank you. Everybody have a great um, evening, and we'll see you next time.